I wanted to ask you about hemophiliacs. Because they had cell-free uh, plasma, it was just the virus. But the virus sheds its membranes within 24 hours. So how, one thing we can go is how was it able to actually infect the T-cells? Yes, it's a question, but uh, uh, we have to know that uh, all the fraction of the blood could be infectious. And there is some virus bound to red blood cells, which could be released also in, in the plasma after uh, treatment or incubation. Some virus is bound to red cells also, as well. Uh, so uh, perhaps there are more virus when you process the blood, more virus could come in the plasma, okay? And the, these virus could be protected by the plasma proteins from denaturation. This is one, uh, one thing, possible, one possibility. The other is the quality of the host. Uh, hemophiliacs are fragile. Being transfused many times, the immune system also is uh, depressed before they get infected with HIV. So they are prone to HIV infection because of their immune system uh, weakness, okay? So combining this with the fact that the virus could exist also in forms, which I'm studying now, which probably are more resistant than uh, we think for the usual particles, could explain. The little ones. Yes, little ones or they bound to Macroplasma proteins, you know, that's uh, possible that mac mac macroplasma are more resistant, perhaps. Macroplasma envelope could be more resistant than the viral envelope. Okay. The, is but the, the, there are all, all hypotheses. I'm not, uh, this is not based on solid data, of course. This is just, assum this, they are just assumption. But to, you are right. This is, an, uh, we have to explain why hemophiles have been so easily infected with uh, plasma products. For you, the entire existence of HIV rests upon the fact that there are no pictures of the purified gradient. Is that correct? It is part of it. That is the most crucial evidence which you need. If there you don't have these pictures which prove that the, there are, in the purified virus, there are the, what they call purified virus, they are virus-like particles, then the whole experiment and thus the existence of HIV it's finished. And you're saying today there is no pictures of purified virus? Today there is no pictures of purified virus. And certainly Montagnier did not publish it, Gallo did not publish it, Levy did not publish such pictures, Weiss did not publish such pictures. Um, and the only pictures which have been published was, in, in fact, this is admitted by the Franco-German researchers in, in 1997, when the first attempts, uh, the first pictures of what is called purified HIV were published by two groups, one from the United States and one fr in a Franco-German study. You said that in 1997 they did try to purify HIV, is that correct? Yes. And you're saying they weren't successful? They're not successful. You know, what, what is more important, this authors, they, they uh, accepted or they admitted, but by 1997, there is no evidence for purification. And here it is. This is from the Franco-German study. Virus to be used for biochemical and serological analysis or as an immunogen, that is as an antigen, is frequently prepared by centrifugation through sucrose gradients. And they said, in none of these studies has the purity of the virus preparation been verified. So by 1997, there is no proof that HIV has been purified. But did they purify HIV? They tried. So they accepted this. As I said, we've been asking this for the very beginning to have some evidence for HIV purification. And these authors tried to present, or well, they did their best to purify HIV. And here is their evidence. This is the Franco-German study. And they had material 
which is meant to represent purified HIV. The top and the middle is obtained, is material obtained from infected cultures and is meant to represent uh, purified HIV. The bottom part is material obtained in the similar manner from non-infected cultures. And as you can see, the arrows, they said, represent the HIV particles. First of all, this cannot be said to be purified virus. As you can see, they are not purified particles. In fact, only the, the particles which they, they put the arrows are said to be particles which look like HIV. The rest are all cellular fragments, or called mm, vesicles. In, the, in uh, the, the material which is obtained from the non-infected cultures, you can see even there, there are some particles which may look like the one which has arrowed. So it is significant, significant that the authors do not call this material purified HIV. In fact, they call it purified vesicles from infected H9 cells, the top, and activated cells. So the authors admit that this cannot be considered purified HIV. With all the effort they, they put, they could not obtain purified HIV. Okay. It is also important that the, the, the particles which are aerot as representing HIV, they don't have all the morphological characteristics attributed to HIV. They, there is no evidence for knobs. In fact, even their diameter is uh, uh, higher than what is considered to be the, the retroviral particles. But does size really matter? I mean, humans vary in sizes. They matter because oh, the, 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 this, in, in the Franco-German, is the size is, they are larger, but not as large as in the, in the American uh, evidence for purification. Here is the effort by the American researchers in purifying HIV. These are their results. And as you can see, they did not, were not able to obtain purified HIV. And again, the particles which are uh, arrowed and are said to represent HIV, mm -hmm. they do not have all the morphological characteristics attributed to lentiviruses. And in fact, they don't have the knobs, they don't have uh, cone-shaped core, you cannot see there, they don't have lateral bodies, which are, uh, they should be in HIV. And most importantly, their diameter is too, they're too large. The average diameter of the, of the uh, of the particle is 220, 234, and none has a diameter less than 160. Just by taking their diameter, it is impossible the, the particles which are labeled as HIV to be HIV. Is the size also important in determining what you're looking at? Yeah, <clears throat> think about uh, viruses can be as big as a pox viruses, up to 300 nanometer. HIV up to 150. The smallest autonomously drawing virus will be a circle virus, just 15 oh, wow. nanometer. So what's the smallest HIV particle that's ever been documented? I think it's, it's something one, 120 to 150. No, these are fixed morphological entities. They don't change. They don't change. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a huge thing in helping you differentiate whether it's HIV or yeah, not. Yeah, the size of a structure is very important to make the diagnosis. Now, if the particles which are labeled by Bess and his colleagues as being HIV, then the, the 
absolutely necessary condition is for the material which was obtained from, uh, from the infected cultures to have proteins which are not present in the material which was obtained from non-infected cultures. Is this, but this does not seem to be the case, and in fact, Bess and his colleagues have come with this evidence. They took the proteins from all the three bands they had, from the two infected cultures, or the, what they called infected cultures, and from the non-infected cultures. And here are the proteins from the non-infected cultures, which they are put in a strip, here are the proteins from the two infected cultures. As you can see, if you look at this, oh, there is a difference, but the difference between the, the strips is only quantitative. That is, we have these bands in all the strips, mm -hmm. only there is less here. Similarly with all the other proteins, in some of them, in fact, they are exactly the same. So by looking at these pictures, the proteins which existed in the purified material, the HIV purified material, and in the material which was obtained from the non-infected cultures contain the same proteins, which means that none of these uh, cultures contained HIV. As I said, if the cultures which contain, they say, contain HIV, they should, must have had proteins which are not present in the non-infected cultures. And yet, this is not the case. The proteins, all the proteins are found, which are found in the infected, the so-called infected cultures, they are also found in the non-infected cultures. Some of them in smaller quantities, but nonetheless, they are there. The difference may be just because the way the cultures were conducted. The American authors labeled the, some of the proteins. And they said the P6, P7, P17, and P24 are labeled as HIV proteins. And these two proteins, that is, proteins which are around 32 and around 41, they were labeled as cellular proteins. No label is put in the proteins which had molecular weight higher than 41. Yet there are many HIV proteins which have molecular weight. Now, why they didn't label them? First, all the proteins which are around 41 and 32 are non-HIV. They cannot be HIV proteins with molecular weight 41 or around 41, and molecular weight of 32 or around 32. Okay. We ask best why they labeled uh, these other three proteins as HIV. And he said that they put this label because that's what the reviewer asked them. But they did not have evidence themselves that they were HIV proteins. He stated that they did not have evidence that they were HIV proteins? Yes, he stated that they did not obtain themselves, but the reviewer asked them to label them as HIV proteins. And he said the reviewer was right. We label them HIV. Did he specifically state they had no evidence those were HIV proteins? Personally, they did not have evidence, yes. Best said that? Yes. In this, in this experiment, they did not obtain evidence, in this experiment, they did not obtain evidence that these proteins were HIV. But they labeled them HIV because the reviewer asked them.